How's the Detroit Sports Podcast going? This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Hey everybody, this is Freddie Cohen of ESPN Radio. When I'm not talking about breaking news or breaking news on ESPN Radio, I'm always a fan and listen to the Detroit Sports Podcast, and so should you. Thanks, everyone, for downloading the latest edition of the Doc and Jock podcast. We're at episode 306. I am the Doc, John Macaroon, joining me, my cousin Adam, the Jock Strozinski. What's up, cuz? Good seeing you on this fine day. You too, sir. Nice out, right? Beautiful weather. This is going to be good, man. This is going to be a good podcast. Yeah, I was talking to Vito, you know, this week, and I asked him, you know, with the nice weather and things like that, what's your favorite thing to do? Is it sit outside and just have a beer? Is it going golfing? Is it, you know, going for a walk with your pets? What's the best thing to do when the weather's nice? Is it is it being in a pool, being around a pool, laying out around a beach? Because, you know, as you get older, you do really value the time when you get to go home. And uh, sometimes I am now lucky to get out of here around 6 o'clock and I can just enjoy uh, a nice night out. And what I typically do now is I'm kind of the old guy now. I set, I set up shop in the garage, have a couple beers, get the hookah ready and just stare off into space with the missus and i'm like man i feel old but you know when the weather's nice you do start to appreciate it a little bit more especially in michigan man tuesday was absolutely gorgeous it was just an amazing day and uh i find myself me personally valuing those days way more but i'm starting to think too maybe i want to become a boat guy too because i see everyone boat on the boat guy. i want to become a boat guy because i see all the ladies out there having fun having cocktails it seems like everyone has a good time i haven't been on a boat in damn near 10 years not one single boat really? in 10 years. I'm not a boat guy. I'm not really a beach guy. I'm not I know a boat there's, guy either. I don't typically go past Novi in terms of like driving out here in Michigan. I don't go too far, so I'm not around the lakes. I don't go to Kensington. I don't even know where a lot of the lakes are where people boat. I do see a couple of people's Instagram, and I'm starting to pay attention. Houghton Lake, Lake Orion, things like that. But I think I might become a boat guy in the next five years. We'll see. See, I have uh, so my cousin Jeff. I think he just bought a boat. He sent me. He sent me like a YouTube page. He was like, what do you think about this boat? And I was like, dude, you're not going to do a boat, are you? And he was like, I'm totally thinking about doing a boat. And I was like, why would you do a boat? Like, you don't want, you don't ever want to be the boat guy. You want to be like friends with the boat guy. Cause it's just, it, that's an expense. Like gas is expensive. Having to, to, to house your boat in the, in the off season is expensive. I make it sound like it's a sport or something, but <laughs> I mean, you know, having to maintain and care for your boat is, is a fee all in, ex- in itself. So, it just becomes very pricey. He's like, but that's a really good deal on a boat. And like, then you've got to like pay for your boat because you got to finance it. Because I don't know about you, but I don't have that kind of money laying around. And this podcast is not generating those kinds of funds. We're not Vito. You know, Vito's like the only one of us who could probably afford a boat straight out. Yeah, there's there's no way. I I'm, I do not want to ever own a boat. I like being on the water. Don't want to own a boat. I just don't want to own a boat because it's way too damn expensive. For me, when it's really nice weather like it was on, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, uh, those are prime days to go and hit the links. I love golfing. I'm not very good at it, but I do love to golf. Uh, so I will go golf, or now that I have a dog, I'm going to be honest with you, man. If I would have knew what I know now, I'd have had a dog years ago. So this took place this past weekend. I'm basically sitting in the garage at the at the apartment complex, I've got the grill going, so I'm gonna I'm gonna grill some uh, some picanha, which is basically the best Brazilian steak you've ever had. And uh, I got to get the coals going. I got to get it nice and hot. And I'm basically sitting inside the garage in one of my little sport fold up chairs. I've got a table next to me, and I've got a Miller Light sitting there on the table. And I'm just cramming Gardettos in my face. Hot chicks just walk by, and I've got the dog out there with me, and they all stop to see the dog. And like a true player, I can't turn it off. Because once they come by, I start talking to them. I let the dog kind of go, and they pet the dog. Oh, my God, your dog is so cute. I love your dog. It's so great. Oh, my God. And they're like, I know. She's super cute. So much energy. She's she's the best thing in the world. You should, uh, you know, swing by later if you're not, if you, when you get done doing whatever you're doing. I just invited this broad back to, to, to the place. Mind you, my wife's upstairs. Who does this? What kind of animal does this? 
this animal right here. I can't turn it off. True player for real. What an annoying scumbag. Yes, I am. So this big booty bitch who is smoking hot, I invite her back to the place so she can come play with my dog and maybe play with my hot dog. You know, it's what it is. But yeah, oh. it's it's if I were to do that, look guys, if you're single, get a dog. Or, or or if you're if you're if you're not married, even if you're married, get a dog. Get a dog, walk that dog, gonna help you pick up chicks. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. So yeah, next time she ended up coming back by, my wife was totally out there, so my cover was blown. But whatever. It was still cool. It was still cool, you know. Thumbs up. So the best thing for you is golf. Get outside. Yeah, golf and golf and the dog, because the dog leads to other chicks, which, you know. It's always a good day. Whatever. <laughs> it's always a good day when, uh, you know, oh, it's always an easy in. And us guys, we're always looking for that easy situation where you can say hello other than, uh, Dude, hey, how you doing? It's a total icebreaker. Like, and my dog just wants to be petted by everybody, just runs up to everybody, and she's really cute. So it totally works. If you're, hey, if you're a big guy, get a small dog. I'm telling you. It, it's nothing that blows their mind. And they're like, what is going on here? You're kind of a big guy. That's a really tiny dog. Can I play with your little dog? Yeah, you can play with my little dog. Come by later. I know you've been talking lately I'm a about scumbag. I can't uh, help it. Man cards and things like that. You can have a dog, no problem. Pet the dog. Even post videos on Instagram about the dog. <laughs> I do all the time. one thing you can't do. <laughs> you hate that, don't you? No, I think it's it, fine. It drives you nuts. <laughs> no, the one thing I would say you can't do is when a guy cups the dog in his hand like a football. I think that's. Oh, that's what I do. That's how that, I carry her. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think that's. Uh, a violation right then and there. Why? A guy should not be carrying a dog like that. I think that's reserved for the ladies. I think, let you know, the dog, the guy should be holding the dog by the leash and yanking it and like, hey, sit your ass here, piss over here, you know, things like that. Oh, no, no, you're all sensitive, cuddling, I, 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 holding I, I, the dog I, in your I, hand. The, Bro, look, the, that's, that's weak sauce the to me. Moment I picked, the moment I picked this, I, all of a sudden I put on trial. I don't know how this happened. I love how you do these things. You're a magician at this. Do you realize you do this? You're a magician. I, look, the moment that, that I got that dog, right? Our very first bonding experience. And the reason why that dog loves me more than it loves my wife, who cares for the dog five out of seven days of the week, is because the moment I held that dog, I picked it up and I held that thing like a football. Because I don't know any other way. Like, when I get a kid, I'm going to hold the kid like a football, too. I don't know any other way. That's so the, gay. You well, know, it's what it is. <laughs> so I had this dog basically cupped on my arm, and she ended up falling asleep. And I was just basically holding it like it was a football. It's it's it. Look, man, I'm a, I'm a, I'm kind of a, a bros bro, right? I'm a guy. Mm. Yeah, no. Oh, you're gay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Keep cupping the dog and posting those videos. And see, you know right, what? Right. This is the guy. This is the guy who who went over to your house and fixed your blinds. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> uh, listen, I'm on the open. I'm not handy. <laughs> It's that's a right brain left brain thing. Oh, okay, is that what that is? One hundred percent. I'm more creative. I'm more the sensitive, creative type. Oh, the sensitive, yes. Yeah, but I'm gay. <laughs> okay, very good. there's a drop for you. <laughs> very good, brother. Oh man, the news of the week. The news of the week uh, regarding the Detroit Lions. A couple things. A couple interesting news and notes regarding the Detroit Lions. Uh, let's start with this uh, easy layup. Hard Knocks decided finally, they announced late on Tuesday that it ain't going to be the Detroit Lions, it's going to be the Oakland Raiders. And everybody, I guess, that paid attention to it really recognized that it's it's a slam dunk. There's so much drama that you can record over there in Oakland, uh, especially with now Antonio Brown, John Gruden. You have a bunch of talent over there in Oakland that potentially could do some things. And I think for the Detroit Lions, I think they're relieved, they're happy. They really looked at it like, not outside of the fact that they film, there, there's a crew, it's, it's a distraction. They really felt like uh, opponents would really pay attention to that and uh, utilize any information that they would gather against the Detroit Lions. You know, I look at it and I, I say that for the Detroit Lions, I think what they should do really, outside of you know the X's and O's and really putting a great product on the field, one of their prime objectives should be to change public discourse and change public opinion about them. I think if you asked 100 fans, just tell me the first two things that you think of when I say Detroit Lions, they're going to cringe and say probably bad franchise, or they're going to say, oh, losers, or they're going to say something negative. Oh, you know, 
Matthew Stafford, oh my God. And they're just going to say things, I think, that maybe would lend to make people believe that, you know, the organization is not good. It's going to be negative. I think out of 100 fans, maybe 70 to 80 of them, their first reaction is going to be, oh, something's wrong with the Detroit Lions. I think they should work hard to change the discourse and do more in the community, get out there more. And they're starting to do it a little bit. Matt Patricia's doing a little bit more podcasts, and he's trying to show a little bit more of his personality. But they again, one. That's a big one. It they, is a big one. It's a big one. And, uh, hey, the, the interviewer was uh, Pat McAfee was dropping, you know, swear words. Look, and Pat McAfee is off the chain. He's off the chain. And But uh, here, but look at this, right? So he did one. He did one. And he did, he did one with a former guy from the league. Yeah, exactly. So come on. like How much are you going to give? Uh, yeah. Like, Matt, Matt Patricia is not coming on, on on Doc and Jock on a Thursday. Do you know what I'm saying? Right. Like, it's not happening. Not yet. It's not happening. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> it's not happening. He might do. He might do. What's her name? Tori Petries. Yeah. Because yeah. who does she work for? Right. The, the team. Lights. You know, she might. He might go do something for the NFL. You have to. When when you say things like this, right? And I get what you're doing. When you say things like this, be careful. Look deeper. He did a podcast for a guy from the league who has a huge voice. Right, he is Pat McAfee has a monster voice in podcasting. It's going to reach a lot of people, so why would you do it really that many more? I mean, well, no, I get that, right? And if he does do another one, it's going to be for I don't know another six months. Yeah, it'll 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 it'll, it'll be content driven for the for the website. Yes, it'll be it'll be the Silver and Honolulu Blue Hot Take Podcast with Tori Petrie because she needs to fill some content, and she was able to get Matt Patricia away from whatever Matt Patricia is doing in the middle of the season. It'll be off a bye week. So he'll do another one. So he's done two. But look at who they're for. Look exactly. at what it is. Exactly. And so that's what I'm saying is that I think Hard Knocks would have provided maybe an opportunity if you wanted to frame it a certain way to say, hey, we are trying to change the culture. We are doing things in a good way. We are protecting. I mean, you don't think that maybe they could have uh, highlighted the stuff that they did to help Matthew Stafford uh, with his wife and things like that, the support in the community. I mean, now the, the Detroit Lions are doing this uh, social you know, driven thing where they're going out to the community a lot more. So they're paying attention to what's going on in their activism. And I think that... Uh, uh, the, the nation could have saw that, but in the end, when you look at it, I think when I was talking to people, I said, if you look at ratings, who's going to really care outside of Detroit? So it, I understand that part of it, and uh, obviously, I no longer am a subscriber of HBO. I cut the cord on that, saving the ten bucks. Uh, realizing you don't stream it? Uh, no, it was part of. Well, what happened was I was part of. Uh, I used to pay for it through Dish Network, and then since November, they still are in a contract dispute. It's not available on really? Dish, so I did it for a couple months through uh, Amazon Prime. I did pay the uh, fifteen bucks, but I realized just not watching it. Really, I could just find a way to you know watch some clips of real sports. I was only watching it for one show, real for sports. Real sports. That, that was it. it. That was it. It's not, not too much on HBO these days. Uh, I know a lot of people were talking about Chernobyl and a lot of things like that. The documentaries are I good. Heard that was really good. Yeah. So I look at it for me. Not worth it to get HBO, but I think the nation, if I still had HBO, I would tune in to see the chaos because everybody wants to tune in for a train wreck. Everybody wants to see what the hell is going to go on with Antonio Brown. Is he going to Instagram live John Gruden's meetings? Is he going to act a fool? What's he going to do? How is he going to show up to training camp? Dude's probably going to show up uh, on a 100-degree day in a fur coat and a, in a full-length mink and uh, handle his business. It's going to be entertaining. So with the Lions, I just think it's a missed opportunity not to be on Hard Knocks, and their attitude about it kind of was blasé. And they told everybody, I mean, publicly, I mean, when, when an organization and their general manager and head coach really just say, we have no interest in being part of it, it tells the producers, you know, hey, they're not interested. They're not going to give us anything. They would have put on a sham anyway. But I just think the Lions, I think one of their objectives outside of winning is to just change the culture, change the narrative a little bit about their franchise. I just think there's a lot of negativity surrounding it from media that cover it, from the lack of success, from the way that the media is treated. I mean, look, the head coach last year, you know, chastised the reporter. And guess what? I did listen to that podcast. Uh, Pat McAfee took shots at the media, you know, uh, talking about, you know, maybe some media members think they're bigger than uh, the, the room and things like that. And yeah, oh yeah, he took shots. I, I tweeted about it. I listened to the whole interview and uh, I definitely put, and I noted in this interview, Pat McAfee took a pro team, pro approach of like, hey, the media sometimes gets too big for their britches and they ask inappropriate questions. And I was looking at it like, oh, come on. But uh, of course, Matt Patricia loved that up and he ate that up and he just said that he's got to work on it a little better. He actually counted how many times he addressed the media last year, which uh, I thought that interview, if you do he- 
chance counted? To, he counted exactly how many times. Yeah, he said, I, 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 I uh, definitely addressed the media this many times. And then Pat McAfee chimed in and he said, yeah, if you, if, if you uh, talk to the media that much, there's always going to be some media that are going to be looking for things, especially if the team is not winning. And they went into like this whole talk about you know the media and, and getting better and things like that. But yeah, there's still – uh, and like we said, you know, we're not saying it. Chris Burke came on and said there's this vibe that permeates Allen Park of us, the entity, the Lions, versus everybody else. When it should be more inclusive. It should be way more inclusive. It's just football. X's and O's. And in the end, I do think you can hide things, you know, really, really well in the NFL. So letting hard knocks in would be no big deal. I would have loved to have seen it. But opportunity gone. It's not going to happen. But I do think maybe in the next two or three years, there's an opportunity for the Lions to be on. And I think if they ever are on that show, they should take advantage of it and uh, try and change that culture. Look, I I get why it's a nuisance to do the show. I I totally do. But I think you're right not that big a deal you now have a podium where you can let people in yeah they can you can change the narrative yeah 100%. you get to control that narrative you, it doesn't have to be this gigantic overwhelming situation no no you can now show off a different side of yourself you know matt stafford can show off it the beer chugging king that matt stafford is right i'm not going to say you're going to go chug beer while you're while you're getting ready for the season but you can show that side of yourself. You Tell know? the story. Exactly. Show the video. Have some fun with it. Let down let down your guard, per se. Exactly. You know, Matt Patricia can come out and, and, and not necessarily chastise the media, but you can now have fun with them. You can show a, a softer side. And I think he's done – this is the one thing I will say about Matt Patricia. I think this season, Matt Patricia is much more comfortable being the head football coach of your Detroit Lions. Last year seemed like it was a struggle. It seemed like it was uh, not even a give and take. It was. It, it really seemed like he was going to war with people in the media. It seemed like he was going to war with, with individuals. And he was using the media to take those shots or he was taking shots at the media. Not so much this season. This season he seems much more comfortable in his own skin. It seems like he has a much better grasp of what he's doing and what the media is there to do. He seemed really uncomfortable last year. So it's better this year, but uh, I think they can do even more. I do too. I, gotta, I agree with I you. I think they got to cease with the attitude of, well, we know what we're doing, and just because you guys question us uh, makes you guys— You don't always have to be the smartest guy in the room. Y- exactly. It's football. Win yeah. the games. And uh, you know, tell us why some of the situations are happening. That's all we want to know mm-hmm. is in this situation, how come the guys keep jumping off sides? Or how come in this situation you decided to run the ball uh, first and second down when you have repeatedly had struggles running the ball? That's all we want to know. Yeah. Well, you know, we have to look at certain matchups and things like that. It's like, come on, you know, we, we're criticizing because we do think that things could be better yeah. if they're run better. And then now look, they, they did change the OC, so that's the big thing people want to see is how this offense is going to look. I'll be honest with you, right? The guys in the media, they're they're pretty smart. Oh, they're, they're, smart. they're pretty intelligent guys. They're watching. They pay attention. They do. All that being said, they're not watching the same game film you're watching before you go into the game. Exactly. So you can just say, hey, the defense was dictating this. This is why we did this. Exactly. Good enough answer. I mean, honestly, that's a good enough answer. We're going to go back. We're going to look at the tape. We're going to be like, were they really dictating that? Let's take a look real quick. And upon closer closer inspection, yeah, I can see why you probably decided to run that. Do you know what I'm saying? It, that, that's usually why it happens. And then we'll say, how come you didn't run to the right gap, damn it? You ran to the left one again. Uh, right. <laughs> I mean, at that point, then we're going to start to really nitpick right, things. Right. But for the most part, the guys in the room are pretty smart. The guys who are making the play calls... You've got much more information than we do. That's why you do what you do. That's why we're asking these questions. Don't be a dick. Just answer the question. That's all you've got to do. 100%. Now, um, news was made early this week as well in the fact that Connor Cook was cut, waived. Doesn't even make it out of minicamp. Uh, I think a lot of people were kind of a little bit taken aback by that in that you don't even let the guy uh, enter into training camp for you. And especially when Bob Quinn comes out and tells the media, hey, the reason why I didn't draft a quarterback is we're happy with the guys in the room. We're happy with Connor Cook. We're happy with Tom Savage. And uh, unfortunately, for whatever reason, Connor Cook no longer part of the Detroit Lions. But then, obviously, the next thing that people think about is, holy cow, that room, that backup room, uh, Michael Lombardi comes out and just blasts and says, by far, the Detroit Lions uh, backup situation is the worst in the NFL. And uh, everyone, I think, in Detroit is definitely nervous that if Matthew Stafford gets hurt, Tom Savage is not the guy you want definitely backing up Matthew Stafford. I think that uh, for me, I look at it and I say, well, they want veteran leadership, but I just think that the majority of fans, myself included, we just want a talented guy that we could believe could go in there and handle business should Matthew Stafford go down. If Stafford goes down with uh, an ankle injury or is down for a couple plays, 
It's just going to be a handoff special. I don't see Tom Savage uh, becoming Nick Foles or doing anything spectacular. Do you? And a new guy they brought in, no one's ever heard of. Yeah. This is this is a big issue. At least for me it is. Right? At no point has Matt Stafford had a viable backup in his career. You could say Sean Hill, and I might give you Sean Hill, right? Because Sean Hill at a certain point in his career came in and could help you win a game. But there has never been a backup quarterback, anybody behind Matt Stafford, to really push Matt Stafford. You might say, hey, Matt Stafford doesn't need to be pushed. He doesn't need a guy behind him nipping at his heels, telling him how to play his game. He's Matt Stafford. He's our franchise quarterback. Bro, bro, bro. Do you realize Tom Brady, arguably the best quarterback in all of the NFL ever? Ever. And the new guy they brought in, his last name's Fails. Right. Could you imagine? Fails drops back. Oh, incomplete. Fails. Could you imagine now if there's that doomsday scenario where Stafford and Savage go out and you have this guy come in? It's That's just... the issue. That's the issue. <laughs> Look, Tom Brady has a, a viable backup, right? Or has had viable backups that have had to push him. They drafted in the second round. They drafted Jimmy Garoppolo in the second round to push this guy, right? You You look no further than... Then, then Drew Brees, another quarterback who's won a Super Bowl and wins playoff games. Drew Brees' backup is Teddy Bridgewater. Say what you will about Teddy Bridgewater. He is a quarterback who can start in this league. You know, is it so much to go out and get a guy like Ryan Fitzpatrick who can win you games? They've never had a viable backup quarterback behind Matt Stafford. What happens if, like you said, doomsday happens and Matt Stafford gets hurt? Thank God he's been reliable. Thank God he's been desert, de, de, uh, he's been durable. He is not this China doll that we all thought he was when he first spent his first two seasons dealing with, with injuries. Thank God he's not that. Thank God the guy is a gamer and shows up and plays with crooked fingers. You know? At some point, though, if you're the Detroit Lions, you should probably start looking at who either the next guy is going to be or put a guy in that room who could challenge your current guy to maybe get the best out of him? Because I don't think we've seen our best football out of Matt Stafford. I think there's a lot more in that tank. And how are you going to get that out of him? When he's the smartest guy in the room? When he's the guy who's telling the other guys what to do? I mean, I don't know about you, but do you tell everybody all your secrets? There's a reason that you're the doc. There's a reason that you sit in that chair. Nobody else does. So is there a reason that Matt Stafford doesn't have anybody else who's better than him in that room? There probably should be at some point. At some point, there needs to be. And just the very notion that, okay, competition's great. It may make Stafford better. It may make him go, you know what? My job is right there on the line. You know what? If they are really willing to draft a quarterback in the first, second, third round, my job's now in jeopardy. I got to actually get it done because when you pay a guy that much money, and you make him the guy, and you give him no competition, and you make him the face of your franchise. It's In essence, there's been this concerted effort through the media to say, we love Matthew Stafford, we're blessed to have Matthew Stafford. That's all well and good. He's a great pro. He's a great guy in the room. Shows up early, works out, stays late, does all the things. Okay, But in an evaluation, if he does 9 out of 10 things great, fine. But the one thing, the one biggest thing that's heavily curved and weighted is the winning part. You know, of course the Lions would have that. A great guy, great leader, great citizen, not a not a bad guy, great, super talented, but doesn't win. But the winning is the most important part. You can't, what are you going to do? You're going to offer him another 10-year deal for $500 million at 34, even though he's never won a playoff game? That is unheard of. Eventually speaking, you have to win. And that's the bottom line. And so bringing in another quarterback, I think that's what's frustrating everybody is by bringing in another backup, you have the opportunity to enhance competition so that the team can get better. And I do think that if the if Bob Quinn would have scoured a little bit more, did a little bit, little bit more work, you could get better than Fails and Savage. No doubt about it. You could have got better. And that's the part that's so confusing is why. Why is there this big reluctance? I think if Stafford was a true pro, he should go out there and say, you know what? If something happens to me as part of a team, I, I'd be okay with the Carson Wentz scenario with, with hell. I work hard. Uh, you know, If I get hurt, someone comes in and gets me a ring. I still got the ring. Carson Wentz still has a ring. And just just, another quarterback came in and did the job. And if you look at it from a team perspective, Stafford should want a better backup. Just because he knows, shit, if if he goes down, the season's over. He knows it and everybody knows it. And it shouldn't be that way, especially when you go out and get a guy 
from Houston that really kind of was kind of broomed out. You at least wanted a guy that maybe lost his job to a younger cat, maybe wanted a little bit more money, like maybe a Ryan Fitzpatrick or a Teddy Bridgewater, somebody that could potentially come in and do the job and has a little bit of experience. Tom Savage just doesn't have enough talent. And say what you will about Connor Cook, the guy's at least played in the postseason, right? He's got almost, almost as many games started in the playoffs as Matt Stafford. You know, my point is, at some point, you got to have somebody in that room who can challenge a quarterback or at least you feel safe with going. You know, if Matt Stafford blows up his arm or if for some reason, I don't know, J.J. Watt annihilates him and he dies on the field, who are you going to throw out there? Who? Okay, here's the better part too, okay? Tom Savage? It's not Tom Savage. It's look, not what, a good, look what the it's Patriots not a good did. Look what the Patriots did. In the name of improving your team, Fine, you draft a quarterback that you think is great, and, and Martha Ford says, absolutely not. This guy will not be the next in line. Fine, you trade him. They stripped out Jimmy G just like that. He yeah. came in, and he handled his business a little bit. I mean, it's not like it's uh, a backup quarterback's not a commodity. No. I mean, Jacoby Brissett was another guy that they drafted high. Nothing wrong with flipping quarterbacks. There's nothing. Look at what goes on in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh has a viable backup quarterback. And if you get lucky and you still want to stick with Stafford, or you want to show that loyalty over that contract, you draft a quarterback in the fourth, fifth round, you flip him for a second rounder. Yeah. You now improved your team. You've done something good. So this overall attitude, I just think that is not the best attitude and the best working thing to do for the Detroit Lions. And it's just, I don't think Stafford gets a free pass. This I, is a team, too, that says... That it's next man up, right? It's next man up. They, it, we're, we want to put guys in the room and we want them to compete. Who's competing with Matt Stafford? Nobody. Nobody. There's no real competition on that front. But do you think he gets a free pass? Do you think yeah. that, in essence, that he's the golden boy, he's been anointed, he's the guy that the organization absolutely loves, that he should be the face of that franchise because of the fact that uh, he embodies everything the Ford wants in terms of the character guy? Absolutely. I mean... I'm not saying that you have to go out and get somebody who's going to take his place. But at some point, you got to have somebody in the room who you at least feel comfortable with if, say, he gets banged up. Because, honestly, the way we talk about it now, if Matt Stafford goes down, the season's over, right? And I know you can say that about, I don't know, 26 other teams. But at some point, you've got to be able to to look at your backup. And you got to be able to say, hey... Can you get in there and can you give us some reps? Tom Savage isn't that guy. What's the new guy's name? David Fails. David Fails. What was <laughs> David Fails doing before, I don't know, Matt Patricia was like, hey, let's go get this guy. What was he doing? <laughs> he was serving Sherbert to somebody. I mean, like, honestly, guys, go look. He was like a used car salesman or something. It's very, it's not good. Honestly, it's not good. So... <laughs> <laughs> the hell are we talking about here? There's a strong chance he, he may not even make it to training camp. <laughs> the first couple of throws Honestly, he makes. Oh, I mean, we got to get rid of him, too. Look, Matt Castle was your backup last year. Matt Castle sucked. Oh, you saw when he came in there? Yeah, oh, he was man. horrible. And it was a perfect example last year. The last one that you had got into some action, and uh, those those throws weren't pretty either. Absolutely brutal. And I'm, look, I'm not saying you got to go out and you got to get an all-world quarterback to be your backup. It's not what I'm saying. All I'm saying is you got to have somebody in there who can challenge. If you're if you're not going to go out there and you're not going to sign a guy, there's nobody out there that you can bring in. What does it hurt to spend a mid round pick on a guy? I thought Jake Rudock was a solid a solid backup quarterback. You seen what he did at Michigan? I thought he had a pretty decent season when he came in and backed up Matt Stafford his first year behind him. And I think we all thought that he was going to take another step forward. They ended up brooming him out, brought Matt Castle in. How'd that work? I think we all believe Jake Rudock was a better backup quarterback than than Matt Castle. All of us, I think, believe that. And what does it hurt to to go out and, and draft another guy in your mid rounds who's going to come in and perform for you? I don't think it hurts you. I really don't think it hurts you. And like you said, you draft somebody high enough, other teams are like, oh wait, what, what's going on? The limited the limited uh, action that he's seen, he looked pretty good. We could throw him out there. He can perform. We could get something out of this guy. You could turn around and flip him. Look what the Patriots did. Come on now. And real quick, I'm starting to get the vibe that Bob Quinn might be calling Snacks and uh, Darius Slay's bluff. I started to think he might double down because, you know, Harrison's going out there on Twitter. Someone asked him uh, on a Twitter page. He said, hey, are the Lions taking care of you? He said, no. Nah. So that means either they're coming in with an offer that he's not happy with or they're saying, look, come to training camp and uh, do your job. We're not going to open the discussion at all. 
So I'm, I'm starting to think that Bob Quinn might take the attitude of, you know what, I'm going to take a hard line stance. And I think many people would agree with that. Take the hard line stance, make them hold out because then, you know, the fans will definitely turn on those guys and they'll be anti slay and anti snacks. I think that Bob Quinn probably is right is within reason to say, you know what guys, I brought you here. Uh, I took you out of a bad situation. Look, you got two years left on your deal. I understand Snacks is doing a great job because he puts it out there like, hey, I've done this, I've done that. He made, he basically had a long thread. It was really interesting in saying that, look, if I do my job on first and second down, there's not another set of downs for them. That's why, you know, third down situations are better for the Lions because of my situation and what I'm doing. So he's done a good job of actually making his case, kind of like what they do in arbitration is to kind of say, why do you feel like you need more money? I understand that, but... You know, Bob Quinn, I think one of the reasons why he brought him in was the price that he was going to command. Absolutely. I don't think he thought maybe Snacks was actually going to do that with two years left. He figured I can at least get last year's service in 18, I can get him for service for 19, and then we'll figure it out later. I, I, I think you're spot on in, in everything that you said. The Take thing, the hard line stand. Be a man and, and say, look, if you guys are not happy, see ya. The thing is, you know, he was Snacks was brought here, right? Snacks specifically was brought here to Detroit because of that contract. That was that was the that was the bonus of going out and grabbing this guy. That was the 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 feather in the cap was oh look at that contract. That's a really reasonable contract. If he plays as well as we think he's going to play, the feather in the cap is we don't got to mess with that contract for another two years. And Snack was like wait wait hold up. I just did all that last season or the half of the last season. I was your best interior defensive player and look at what look at what your defensive ranks did the moment I was brought in. Pay me and the Lions are like wait wait hold up. You did that in a half a season. You know, we still got two more years left on your deal. Show us. Show us. And this is kind of where you're at now. It's almost a stalemate. And the Detroit Lions, I think, are, are very rare. I mean, I look, I just persecuted them for probably 15, 20 minutes about what they did with their quarterback room. I think the Lions are in the right here. You, you need to go out there and you need to show me. You got two years left on your deal. On top of that, look at your age. You know, it, it's the NFL. Guys don't get better as they get older. Only Tom Brady has found that fountain of youth. That's the only guy. Nobody else in this league really has gotten better as they've gotten older. And I like saying this because I think this will be the first test for Bob Quinn in terms of how he handles a player situation. How is he going to handle it? Is he going to say some things? Is he going to take a hard line stance? I want to see how Bob Quinn handles it. Does he find a way to resolve this and keep the player happy? Because, you know, there's still times where players get the new deal, but it's not what they wanted, Mm -hmm. and they still end up getting, you know, what they call resentful, where eh, they're good, but they're not happy with the organization. And when the player's not happy and they got that diva mentality sometimes, you know, it can cause some problems in that locker room. More vocal, maybe, per se. Maybe they will come on the Doc and Jock podcast and say, look, I'm underpaid. I'm not happy. You know, See, because some of the information that gets out sometimes to the media is is through the players that are disgruntled. That's the best that's the best kind of source you can get is an athlete that's not happy. Oh well, man, they'll give you some good juicy information. I, I'm really interested in what Darius Slay does because yeah. he is a leader in that locker room, yeah. right? And he is a guy who has played here his entire career. He is a fan favorite. And for the most part, he's a guy who's who does a lot in the community. So what happens with Darius Slay? You know, it, look, Snacks, and th- this is kind of where it's a little bit messy with what's going on because it's okay for Snacks to do this, right? But I don't think it's okay for Darius Slay to do this. It, as weird and as troubling as that might sound. He's one of our own. It, it, it's not even so much that. It, it's more the case of Darius Slay just signed a big contract. You don't need another one right now. and. Their situations are a little bit different. Darius Slay is a younger guy. He's probably going to get re-upped by the Detroit Lions anyways. If not this year, it'll probably be next year. Just because of his age, the position he plays, and as as brutal as this is going to sound, what he means to this team. Whereas Snacks, for as good as he is, he's older. He's an interior defensive lineman. I'm not saying that those guys fall off trees because... Look, look, go to go to uh, uh, Pro Football Focus. His numbers show you that they don't, but he's an older guy, and it's a less high-end position. So you're stating that if they do keep one, if they do make the move to extend one and make you make one of them happy, it's Darius Slay. Yes, but what, younger but what I'm say, what I'm stating is it's a very dangerous game that their agent is playing because you're you're trying to leverage both players to make a statement and to send a statement. But both players are not equal. 
And maybe both players, players want, and there's almost a situation where both players are not probably going to get it. Exactly. You can't do both. Exactly. You have the same agent. Exactly. So it becomes very, very tricky to try to do that. And you might end up, if you're the agent, you might not end up cutting your, you, you know, your face. Help one guy hurt the other, yeah. Despite, you know, your nose here. Yeah. So it becomes very, very tricky what's going on there. It's time for our first time out. Got to show love to the sponsors. Second half of the podcast, we got to address the major news regarding Kevin Durant and uh, David Ortiz. Stay with us. You're listening to Doc and Jock, episode 306 on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Adam, one of the great sponsors of the network is the Motor City Pawn Brokers. The Motor City Pawn Brokers are the one-stop pawn shop when you're in need of short-term cash or are looking for quality brand name new and pre-owned merchandise with locations in Detroit, Ferndale, Roseville, and Warren. Their mission is to deliver exceptional value. To check out all the great deals at the Motor City Pawn Brokers, go right now and visit MotorCityPawnBrokers.com. That's MotorCityPawnBrokers.com, a great sponsor of the network. And cause you know what I love when we do a call to action and we say, Hey, there's this great new chat application where you can get involved, where you can talk Detroit sports and then put that call to action out on our Twitter page at Detroit podcast. And a couple people sign up uh, last night. We were talking about KD should Kevin Durant be extended now that he's hurt. And a lot of people were like, well, yes, maybe no, but there's a lot of teams potentially that are interested. Well, you can get in on the conversation through this great new application. It's called flick. All you got to do is follow us on social media at Detroit Podcast. When we put out a call to action, just definitely click the link and join the Detroit Sports group. And it's real simple. You can chat. You can create your own forums. If there's a topic that you want to talk about, boom, bring it to the table. Adam, myself, all the guys will weigh in. If you're hosting a podcast and you want to let people know when it airs or some of the topics that you're discussing, go check out Flick. It's a great, easy application. That's the one thing I love is you can just click it and boom, all the topics are right there. It's super easy. I wouldn't use it if it wasn't easy, if it was so complicated. And if you already have it and you want to join the Detroit Sports Podcast group, all you got to do is click the little add button. And then when you type in group, you type in all lowercase DSP. I can't speak highly enough about uh, Flick. It's going to be a huge, huge application. A lot of people are going to sign up very, very soon. And it's a great application. I definitely endorse it. And they're a great sponsor of the network. Go today. Join Flick. Get in on the action. Sometimes stories develop and it lends to some interesting debate. This whole situation regarding Kevin Durant has been fascinating in that um, you got this guy who's on the verge of a massive mega deal and he plays for the Golden State Warriors. And there was initially this talk. It's so fascinating to dig into this. Uh, there was this talk because of the fact that the Warriors swept the Trailblazers uh, without Kevin Durant. And then people started to get into the, oh, remember, this was a championship team without Kevin Durant. Let's start to discuss the value of Kevin Durant. And then, obviously, you play an elite team like the Raptors with one of the great players in the NBA, Kawhi Leonard. And you struggle. You go down 3-1, and KD's hurt because he's got this calf injury. And then everybody's like, oh, boy, uh, what's going on? A month? What's going on? I think Kevin Durant should be back by now. Does he have heart? Is he trying to, uh, you know, go into business for himself? And all of a sudden, after the three-one deficit, you see Kevin Durant. He's back and he's hobbing around and he's looking good. He's got energy. And that first quarter, he was making shots, looking like Kevin Durant, looking like, oh, now we got a series. But unfortunately, you know, in the second quarter, early on, boom potentially tears his Achilles. We still haven't heard official word yet, but everybody zoomed in. And I know you saw it when he popped it. Everybody zoomed in and saw it and was like, holy shit, you know, what happened? Now the, the narrative changes. Was Kevin Durant right to come back? Who's at fault? Should potentially doctors have maybe noticed that calf injuries sometimes weaken the Achilles and this could have happened. And then you also can uh, start to examine the mindset of Kevin Durant. If you're Kevin Durant, uh, because of this injury, you have to ask it. If you're Kevin Durant and you're staring, you know, whatever the big numbers are, let's say, you know, seven years, $280 million if the big number is over $40 million. If you're staring that number in the face, a super max deal that potentially someone could offer you, do you rush back? Why would you do that? If there was anything, if you were invested in yourself, you would ask that question. I got this calf injury. I got this situation. Uh, man, it could potentially get worse. Now, if the, if all the doctors tell you, that it can't get worse, and this is just a freak thing. It's the worst kind of luck you can possibly have. But I would be, I'm thinking about it now. 
I'm more of a team guy. I would definitely want to get back out there to win a ring, but you already have one. Sometimes you do got to go into business for yourself. So this whole discussion of should Kevin Durant have even been back with down 3-1, with a calf injury, maybe being told and advised that your calf, you know, probably is not going to get that much worse, go out there, and he looked okay. This seems like a freak injury, but at the same time, and Kevin Durant's going to be okay. He can opt in and say, all right, I'm going to take a free year to rehab for $30 million. In what world is that possible where you can just say, you know what, I'm going to get a $30 million windfall. But potentially, and like I talked about with some of the people on Flick last night, I said he might potentially cost himself hundreds of millions of dollars because he may not get that max deal. Some people will always come out and say, oh, yeah, I would have gave him that max deal. But I don't know, a general manager would be hard-pressed to look at an Achilles injury and then say, I got to sign this guy sight unseen because he's going to play what? If he comes back next April, 10 games. It's a fascinating look, but I'll start with this with you. If you're Kevin Durant, you got that calf injury, staring down big boatloads of money from the Knicks, from maybe the Warriors, from a myriad of teams who've actually, you know, produced things and said, hey, we're going to clear the cap space for me. Would you have come back? Would you have been a guy that said, I'm coming back to help the team? All day. All day. I, I, I probably wouldn't have. All day long. I probably would have said, I, uh, I, I need the money. I, I'm, if you're asking, would I do it all day long? Because my mentality is I'm going out there and I, I'm playing. And that team, as as messed up as this sounds, that team needs him. Of course. That, no uh, look, Toronto is is Golden State's elixir. They, they, they are the, the miracle cure for whatever Golden State has. I don't even care if, if Clay's 100%, right? Toronto, this is the point I was trying to make. And I, I I didn't even buy into my own point because it was Golden State, right? Golden State is, is, is the be-all, end-all. Every time Toronto has played Golden State going into this series, Toronto has beat them. It wasn't just that Toronto beat them. It was the players on Toronto had games. And not like games of their lives, but they had games where they just balled out. Kawhi played 10 to 15 points better than his season average when he played Golden State. Pascal Siakam played 10 points better than his season average. Kyle Lowry had, I think, five to seven more assists every time he played against Golden State. So it, it was it was the big guys playing better, but the little guys were contributing too. And it was the defense that they threw at Golden State every time they played them that made things so worrisome if you were a Golden State Warrior. Now fast forward to the playoffs, and guys are beat up. Guys are banged up. Golden State's kind of limping into this series. And I was trying to make a point, but I didn't even buy my own point because it was Golden State. Do you know what I'm saying? Golden State's a machine. They're a force. You've got arguably the, the best player in the league in Kevin Durant sitting on a shelf rehabbing what appears to be a calf injury. Okay, cool. No big deal. You know, they just handled everything they had to handle without him. They're going to be fine. They still have Clay. They were a super team beforehand with Clay and Draymond. And you've got arguably the best shooter in the league with, with Steph Curry who can hit a shot from anywhere. He didn't necessarily need Clay or you didn't necessarily need KD. You didn't need necessarily any of these guys because you're still so deep. I think one of the prevalent things I've heard across media is really nobody's to blame. Nobody's to blame. It's a freak situation. It's, that's what it is. It's a freak show of a situation because you didn't think you necessarily needed the guy, and then you realize you kind of do need the guy, and it's just a calf injury, right? That's all it is, just a calf injury. Tape it up. A month put, off. He took a month off. Put one of those little sleeves on. A month away from the game. We'll bring you back. You'll be good to go. My big concern with, with going into game five was, is his cardio going to be there? You know, it wasn't even so much the, the leg injury. If the doctors say you're good, you're good, you practice that day, you feel all right, and you've seen what he did that first quarter, right? I mean, his first 10 minutes on the floor were absolutely bananas, absolutely nuts. And then all of a sudden, he goes to make a little move, make a little jab step, just like you've seen him do a thousand times before, and he buckled. His leg buckled and gave out on him. Whose fault is that? Not the doctor's. Not necessarily KD's fault for wanting to come back and play. It just happened. It just sucks because it was in arguably the biggest game with the biggest spotlight in the biggest series with the biggest 
payday at the end of it all on the line. That's what the issue is. So looking ahead, I posed the question on our Twitter page, and it got a decent response on both sides. If you're a general manager, and uh, the way I posed it was, if you were the Pistons and you had the money, obviously the Pistons are strapped and they're, you know, obviously step, they're at step one in terms of a rebuild. They actually have to get the cap space, and they got to wait out these awful contracts before we can even have this discussion. But if the Pistons did have a max deal, and they could go out there and they could... You know, look to Kevin Durant, uh, you know, if he doesn't decide to opt in and they say, okay, we got these free agent dollars. Knowing now that he has his Achilles injury, do you sign him to a max deal? Would you bring KD here knowing now that he's 30 years old and is going to have to, you know, have a year of rehab? I would say no. This toughest decision, I would say no. You can't do it. A guy with an Achilles injury can't get max dollars. If you can get him down a little bit, get him in that, you know, $25, $22 million range, if you can get him way less than the max, you probably entertain it, but uh, reports came out that several GMs are lining up and still would give him the max deal. I just couldn't. If I was a general manager, knowing that the guy, the biggest part of your game is your feet. <laughs> I mean, that's the biggest part of a basketball player's ability. Now, look at Boogie Cousins. The guy was regularly dropping 35. The guy could handle his business, was a great NBA player. Now, we're all clapping when he gets 12 and 10. And oh, because he's a shell of himself, and defensively, he's, he, he's a liability. And you it's a don't big problem. Ever come back from an Achilles Not the same. injury the, Not the same. same way, and it, and it's just because of the nature of the injury, right? It, it, it's it, it's one of those things where if it is a, if it is an Achilles injury, again, nobody is not one hundred percent certain that that's the deal. We we all believe that, and I, I think you, as I, ninety percent sure at this point, that's what it is. Or ninety nine percent sure. There, there's no we we can't speak definitively. For, definitively, yeah, but. What it looks like in, you know. It's an oh shit situation. Yeah, what it is. We're going to say it's an Achilles injury. You, you can't do that. Not not if you're, you're, you're a responsible franchise. I mean, you can make the argument that, hey, 90% of Kevin Durant is still better than just about anybody else out there on, you know, on the face of the earth. Cool, bro. This is the guy who you want to build your team around? The guy who's basically now has an Achilles tendon that snapped and has to get stitched back, so now it's tighter, it's shorter. It doesn't allow him to jump as high. It doesn't allow him to 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 move as quick. It doesn't give him all the 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 talent and the edge that made him what he is. On top of that, it doesn't give him those abilities that he had that made him so special. He now has to learn how to play with that being the case because it's not just the fact that that was taken away from him. It's now the fact that he has to somehow alter his game. He has to change what he brings to the table to now compensate. And is he mentally strong enough to do that? And this is the one thing about Kevin Durant. As good as Kevin Durant is, the one weakness in Kevin Durant's game is between the ears. He is soft. That's why he has 19 burner accounts. That's why he goes after guys in the media. That's why he sits there in the thought process was he was going to leave. He was going to leave Golden State to go play for the Knicks. godforsaken fucking Knicks. Yeah, who's the that? Knicks? Are you fucking serious? Right. The fucking Knicks. That's the worst You're going to go right? play for the fucking Knicks? Get the fuck out of here. It's the Knicks. But, Give me a break. Why? Because you need to show that you're that you're the top dog, that you're the best player in the game. You are the best player in the game. You're better than LeBron James right now. Before your leg injury, you were the best player in the game. But also, too, outside of the game, the Knicks, yeah, obviously bad ownership, bad talent. But you look at it, too, uh, the outside stuff, business opportunities, meetings, uh, high power people are in New York. So I always think that when, when players look at those situations in L.A. and New York, there's obviously some factors outside of the game that potentially could help because, yeah, nobody in their right mind, you're absolutely right, would want to play for the Knicks because it's absolutely a shit show Dude, over there. you live on the West Coast. You, you, you basically, you live in San Francisco, right? Tech Valley's like down your street. It's cool, bro. You have opportunities. Yeah, cool. I get it. L.A.? L.A.'s right there. You can go to L.A. if you want to hobnob. It's not... The world is so small. Honestly, the world is so small. I, I don't care about your business opportunities that you could get in, in New York. You can get them in L.A., and if it's that important to you, they'll fly to you. Exactly. They'll come to you. I want to highlight two of the reactions. I think it kind of lends to where people could be at. Uh, James Rankin gets in on our Twitter page to that question. No to KD. I would rather give big money deals to younger superstars. Some of these long-term deals to pass their prime stars end up being really painful more often than not in, in all forms of pro sports. I'll give Giannis a max deal. 
all day. No problems. And then uh, Jeff Fitzgerald gets in. He says, absolutely. Be different if he was a high flyer like Vince Carter or something. His game will be fine. So we've gotten a mixed bag of reactions across the board. A lot of people are like, dude, you got to be a KD hater to not want this guy. He'll be fine. And then the others are just like, you know, agreeing with us and say, ah, I'd have a hard KD. time. I love KD. I wouldn't give KD the money. No, I wouldn't I either. I wouldn't. It's unfortunate. I, I wouldn't, wouldn't either. No. You know? I, I think KD is the best player in the NBA. I think he's better than LeBron James. I really do. I believe that. Okay. I'm still not giving him that money. Turning our attention to the Raptors. I'm sorry. I'm, I like. I spit at no, you and I spit on you. It was very. I, I got very projectile. Impassioned. Yeah. They, sorry. My bad. Did the Raptors and Nick Nurse fuck up in Game Five? They had the lead and without KD. And there's no situation in which you say, "Well, you're at your house. You got the celebration going on. You got uh, potentially opportunity to win in your house with Drake in attendance, and you don't let it happen." I want to take you behind the scenes. I want to take you. I want to take you behind the scenes. So a lot of the stuff with with DFN's Twitter account comes from me, right? Yeah. Um, Ryan is 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 great with it. Oh, you're the guy behind WDFN so, who's promoting himself twenty times a day. I, I Listen to the practice squad next yes, week. Listen yeah, to the practice yeah, squad next yeah, week. Listen me. to the practice squad. That's I'm me. like, wait a minute, I think that's, that's Adam. Me. That's me. That's this guy. <laughs> next week. Listen to the practice, practice squad. squad. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, you got to take advantage of it, right? You got it. Anyways, so Ryan does a great job too. So it, it's basically a two man show here because. Heaven forbid they invest a dollar bill into that goddamn station. Whatever. Different story, different day. We'll talk about it later. Anyways, it, it, it's me and Ryan. And uh, I'm sitting there, and I've got, I've got the tweet ready. i got the tweet ready. And it's, it's, it, I think it goes something along the lines of, Canada rejoice. Uh, the Toronto Raptors just won the 2019 NBA uh, championship, or NBA finals. I don't remember exactly. And then it was... Uh, I give detailed Toronto Raptors beat the Golden State Warriors, such and such. Like you leave a blank spot for the yeah. for the points or whatever. Uh, in game five, take the series four to one, and then I've got all like the hashtags at the end. I have it queued up. I've got it queued up. Ready to press it. I'm I'm, ready. I'm gonna be first. Damn it! I'm, I'm gonna be I'm good. ready to I'm ready to put some money, you know, yeah. some numbers in, and I'm ready to hit the send button. I even got the gift of some hot chick who. It is all decked out in Toronto gear, ready to go. I've got it ready. I've got it ready to go for for the for the Twitter. I've got it ready to go for the Facebook. I am Rets. I am Rets to hit send. Nick Nurse calls a timeout. Yeah, <laughs> kills the momentum. Everything changes. The entire game changes. Draymond Clay start hitting threes, and uh, the the offense dried up. The, it was wild, man. They had a chance. They had a chance. I mean, I was I was putting tweets out there about how Kawhi was was on fire, and he smelled the championship, and the goose is the goose is cooked. It's all done. Let's go. Toronto's gonna win. I did. I stayed up so late. I I got four hours of sleep the next day. Because I was ready to bask in a Toronto Raptors glorious win. Tonight, game six. <laughs> do they take it down? Do they go yes, back to Toronto? they do. They it's take done? It. Series it's done, done tonight? Series is done, man. Look, that game was won off the emotion of Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant came in and basically gave you enough in one quarter where you could limp it all the way to the finish line, and that's what happened. Kevin Durant's leg then goes boom, and those guys rallied around him, right? And it wasn't just those guys rallying around him. Parts of uh, of of the Toronto Raptors team rallied around Kevin Durant to to support him. All that being said, all that being said, Toronto wanted that game. I think Kawhi wanted that game, and it was just one of those things where the Raptors couldn't pull the trigger in the final what was it thirty seconds of that game. Uh, it's just one of those things. They win Game Six. This does not make it to a game seven. Toronto wins this. And I think you will start to see the dismantling of the Golden State Warriors. As awesome as that team was put together and the way that team was constructed, I, I, I think you will start to see the dismantling of that dynasty. The funny thing will be, is it going to be at the hands of, of a guy like Clay who decides to go someplace else? Or is it going to be the hands at a guy like KD who says, you know what? I'm going to opt in. I'm going to sit here, and you're going to pay me $31 million to rehab for this next season. I'm going to tie you up, and you can't do shit about it. 
it's going to be really funny to see what happens to Golden State because it's all going to go boom. But how? How does it go boom? Who makes it a miserable exist- existence for the Golden State Warriors? Because it's all going to come from the inside, right? Is it going to be because guys leave and they want more money, like a guy like Clay who wants a, a larger role? Or is it going to be a guy like KD who says, no, nah, I'm going to sit here. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to tie your books up for this season when there are tons of guys going everywhere. And you could have one of those guys, but no, nah, you can't. You got to pay me. Pay me my money. One final note. I mean, unfortunate news in the world of baseball when we hear the news that David Ortiz gets shot in the Dominican Republic. Now, you and I have talked about this quite a bit, especially with the kidnappings. I I hearken back to podcasts where we said, dude, there's a bunch of guys that are going down to the Dominican Republic, and there's these bad guys that take these guys and kidnap their family members and things like that for ransom in order to live, in order to you know take a bunch of money from these athletes. And you and I said, look, if you're from Venezuela, if you're from the Dominican Republic, be super careful what you're doing. And the reports about maybe some of the reasons why David Ortiz got shot are wild. Go check them out. We're not going to sling rumors here. I, we did it on the uh, uh, Too Bad Hombres podcast just a little bit. But you look at it and you say, look, David Ortiz is hanging out in his home country and he's chilling. And I did click on the video. It's it, that security you know, cam style footage. And he's just sitting there and some guy rolls up on him and shoots him and he hunches over and it's crazy because there's footage then of what happened to the guy, to the shooter, the, the uh, a bunch of people kind of, you know, clamor to him and then beat the crap out of him. So I look at it and I say, man, why are these athletes with so much money going to these places that are potentially dangerous? Why are they willing to risk a lot potentially to go down gods, to- man? Exactly. They don't believe in it. Right. So I wanted to ask you. Is there a place? Because obviously now I'm scared. I don't think my wife said, oh, we're not going to the Dominican Republic. We're not going to Punta I've been Cana. there. It's not that bad. It's not that it's bad. It's not that bad. Is there a place that if... Stay in your resort, though. Yeah, stay in it's your resort. Not, it's not that bad. Stay in your resort. Stay in your resort. Right? <laughs> is there a place that you absolutely would not go to, even if I paid you a million dollars? Is there a place that uh, has such a bad reputation that you've heard of that you say, forget about it. I'm not going there. Oh, man. Columbus. Columbus, uh, <laughs> that's good right? you can't pay me a million dollars and i go to columbus um we, we kind of kicked this around a little bit last uh the the two nights ago you know we we're kind of starting to spitball ideas for for putting the show together and i was like man i i it, it's really really hard for me to come up with a place where i wouldn't go you know i'm just not gonna go there because and you've gone to south america you've traveled a little bit yeah i i've i've been to a few different places i've been to the dominican republic you know, that's where me and the wife went for our honeymoon. We stayed on a resort, though. We didn't leave a resort. I've been to Jamaica. This is the thing I'll say about Jamaica. And when I, when it all kind of comes down to it, I don't know if I'll ever go back to Jamaica. I've been to Jamaica twice, and I had a great time both times I've gone. And I've gone off the resort the one time in Jamaica. And I don't know I don't know if, if I'd do it again. And I don't know if I'll go back to Jamaica even to stay on the resort. And I've got a couple, I've, I've made friends with the people in Jamaica, you know, like the people who are on, on our resort, uh, you know, people who live there. I just don't know. I don't know if I put myself in those positions again. Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, so Jamaica is, is, is not on the list of places you want to go. It, it just, it, it has fallen. After that, man, it's, it's weird because there are places in the Middle East I'd really want to go, but the Middle East is crazy. It's absolutely nuts. It's unpredictable. Those kind of yeah. places obviously make the list. You know, places in the Middle East, places in South America, parts of Africa that you just don't want to go no, to. No, I just there, there are parts of Africa you you can't pay me enough. Well, money. lately for me, not that I, I probably do want to go check out Cancun. I've never been to Mexico. That's one of the places I definitely want to go to. Never been to Cancun. Never been uh, down there. But the stuff you hear in Mexico mm-hmm. makes me not want to go. Obviously, the first thing that people say is don't drink the water. And I'm like, dang it, you got to have water. You got to be careful. I don't want Montezuma's revenge at all. And the stuff that you hear in terms of, I don't want to get caught up in no crossfire because I'm not doing the, you know anything shady. I'm not uh, transporting like anything. This. I would go to Cancun, yeah. But other than that, I'm not going anywhere in else in Mexico. That's it. Nowhere else. Nowhere else. Just Cancun. And again, I'm staying on my resort. I would. I will say this, right? And it's just because I'm a dog, and I think their women are absolutely gorgeous. I think their women are beautiful. I love my wife, but if I could maybe trade her, in, I love my wife. Um, Colombia, Colombia, I would go to. I would too. Their women are too. It's like they fell out of heaven. Colombia. Colombia. Yeah, you like yourself some South American uh, situations, huh? <laughs> South American situations. South American nights. But it's crazy <laughs> that David Ortiz situation is, is wild, it's, man. It's you got to be careful. Bananas. Every offseason, 
uh, the foreign players that go back. I just it's freaky because of the fact that you know probably within a earshot of getting fatally killed. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, the guy rolled right up on him. It's nuts. Did you click on the video? But, uh, no, no. You but I, I see. I seen the. I see. I have a hard time. He's on the stills. I, I not not of David Tree. I seen I seen the video of the guy getting beat up. Yeah. Um. I think Barstool. Yeah. Put yep. that out. So I yep. seen that video and I was like, I watched that and I was like, Ooh. And here's the thing, man. We, the area the area that we live in, right? Everything is is just at a click. Yeah. You can you can see everything just by clicking on it. And the thing is, I have clicked on so many things. I never feel fulfilled after watching them. I don't. I always feel. I always feel dirty, and I feel slightly broken inside. It, it, it's weird. I don't know if you have that, but I do. I, I will. I'm like, okay, you know, I hover over the button. Like, do I want to click it? Do I want to see it? And then I'll talk myself into clicking it because my curiosity gets the best of me, and I will click it, and then I will watch it. While I'm watching it, I halfway turn away where I'm like, I can't, I can't watch that. And then I come back and I finish it. And then after watching it, I feel so broken inside and I feel so filthy that I'm just like, what is wrong with you? How did you just watch that? And I'm like, what is wrong with people? Where are we going? We're going to freaking hell in a handbasket, you know? And, and you know, these things have existed forever. The stuff like this has happened and, and probably worse atrocities have happened over the course of history. But the thing is, you don't need to see it. You didn't need to see it. You didn't see it. Yeah. It was always it was always in the shadows. But now with the era that we live in where everything there's a camera attached to we it. We all want to be voyeurs. Yeah, it, it's just you can see it all. So I'll hover over the button and, and I'll convince myself to to click on it and and I I'll click it and then I'll watch it, you know? I mean, we all watch it. It's just what happens. And- I think for people's mental health, I think what people are doing now you see on phones they have these timers that tell you how much you've been on and things like that. I think being away from social media for times, and sometimes you don't have to click on it. I think that's fair to yeah. make that choice is just to, you know, the violent, gory stuff. And sometimes, too, I know that you and I, you know, we, ha- we looked at some tweets and we're like, oh, read this. Sometimes you don't have to read it. Yeah, I just feel dirty afterwards. I feel, I feel broken. And it's like parts of me have, have died, and you can't ever get it back. Like once you, once you cross over, you can't go back. And small parts of you just 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 die with that video, with whatever was in that video. You just you're you're ruined, and it's horrible. It's awful. Well, I know I don't want to end on a sour note, but I enjoyed the conversation this last hour with you. Great podcast. You can find the Detroit Sports Podcast anywhere that podcasts are aired. Now, finally, we got on iHeart. You pulled some strings and got us on the iHeart Network. Dude, so that, that was... Uh, it took forever, six months. Jesus All right. Christ. Hey, shout out to Joe Warner. Thank you. You know, Joe Joe is... Uh, he's the, the digital guy at uh, iHeart Detroit. Joe doesn't get enough credit. Joe, and, and everybody knows Joey from everything he does on Channel 955, but Joe Warner doesn't get enough love, and I'm going to put him out there right now. Joe Warner, I love you. I love your little redheaded self. You're the man. I appreciate everything you did, all the strings you pulled. Thank God. I mean, honestly, Joe started pulling strings back a while ago, and finally he followed up with me, and I followed up with him, and I was like, dude, I don't I, – you know, at this point, I don't even care. And he was <laughs> like – I no, I told him that. I was like, right. dude, I don't even care at this point. Like, it's been such a freaking headache. Yeah. I don't understand this. I was like, you've got crumb bum podcasts out there that they just – Get on. Uh, exactly. And I'm just like, how the hell do those guys get on? Exactly. But I work here. Yeah. I do good work with you. <laughs> yeah. And I, I was like, you you know what I what I bring to, to, to this to this cluster. Our feed and, is easy and, to find. Right. I was like, I've given you everything you've asked for. He was yeah. like, I know, I know. I was like, no, man, this is BS. I was like, I don't you know, I don't even want it anymore. Right. I was like, don't I don't even care. I was like, honestly, if you if you can't get me on, I don't give a shit. Right. I don't care anymore. I was like, this is crap. I don't care. And he was like, No, don't say that. And I was like, No, I'm serious. I don't care anymore. And next thing you know, he made some things happen. So Joe Warner, I love you, you little ginger spice. I love you so much. I appreciate you. Thank you, Joe. You can follow Adam on Twitter at Adam R S T R O Z. Follow the network at Detroit Podcast. Looking forward to talking to you guys next week. Thanks, everybody. It's not over yet, so you ask me that one next week. Go blue, bitch. This was locker room talk. Second dick. Sorry, Detroit. It didn't quite work out. And I, all I can say is Detroit Sports Podcast scores. I have voices in my head. They count to me. They understand. They talk to me.
Chile.